Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, today's um, panel. My name is Inga Leonova. I am the editor-in-chief of The Wheel, the independent journal of Orthodox Christian thought, theology, and culture. Our mission is to articulate the gospel intelligently and constructively for the 21st century, a pluralistic era that presents Christianity with new and unique challenges, calling for a creative reimagination of the church's social identity and role in public discourse. We have been in circulation since 2015. We're a quarterly journal, and if you're not yet connected to us, I invite you to visit us online uh, at willjournal.com and subscribe to either our print or online edition. Uh, we're very honored to host today's gathering of the eminent Orthodox theologians to discuss the crisis unfolding in the world around the ideology of the Russian world or Ruski Mir. This ideology has been developing since at least the 1990s under the auspices of the Russian Orthodox Church in the bowels of a unique assembly called World Council of Russian Peoples, an assembly that is presided over by the Patriarch of Moscow and is comprised of clergy, laity, and hierarchy of the Orthodox Church. The catalyst for today's gathering is the so-called Edict of the Council, introduced by Patriarch Kirill of Moscow on March at the assembly on March 27th of 2024, and entitled, The Present and Future of the Russian World. This remarkable document defines in detail such notions as the Holy War, which at this moment is Russian war against Ukraine and the West, uh, the Russian world, as well as establishes positions of the Council on domestic and foreign policy, education, economics, and so forth. The Will has published a rigorous analysis of the edict, as well as the primer of, on the Council itself and the Russian world ideology by the Ukrainian historian and theologian, Professor Serhii Shumilo. Professor Shumilo's article is available free on the Will's website. Uh, before introducing today's panelists, I would like to go over the format and logistics for today's seminar. Uh, we envision it as a roundtable discussion uh, focusing on the following items. Development of the Russian world ideology and World Council of the Russian people as its vehicle. The unique status of this organization and in its quest quasi-ecclesiastical and super-ecclesiastical aspects. Uh, we'd like to discuss whether the teaching about the Russian world and the pronouncements of Patriarch Kirill can be considered a heresy in the ecclesiastical theological terms. Uh, in light of all these developments, uh, what is the responsibility of the Orthodox Oikumena, uh, especially but not limited to the synods of the Orthodox churches? And last but not least, based on the la latest development, the unprecedented re resolution number 2540 of PACE, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, uh, which was uh, uh, approved just a few days ago at the PACE Assembly, and it uh, accuses Patriarch Kirill and the hierarchy of the Russian Orthodox Church of being complicit in war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, our panel will run uh, for with the panelists for a little over an hour. Um, I will be moderating the discussion. And at the conclusion, we will have a 20 to 30 minutes uh, Q&A session with the panelists. You will be able to ask your questions either in the chat section of the meeting or uh, use the reactions button at the bottom of the Zoom screen and um, uh, raise the hand, your hand, and I will call on you. Uh, our editor, Michael Clark, will assist with the interactive, interactive portion of the discussion. Uh, please note that this is a Zoom seminar. It is being recorded, and it will be posted on the Wheel uh, YouTube channel once we edit it. Okay, and 
Now I would like to introduce our panelists. Spotting them for the introduction. Sister Dr. Vastalaren uh, is a Russian Orthodox liturgiologist. She's the founder of Coffee with Sister Vasa, a nonprofit organization for the production of online and offline catechetical programs and religious education. She's the author of many scholarly articles, a monograph of Byzantine hierarchical liturgy, Reflections with Morning Coffee, Lent with Sister Vasa, a healthy fast Lenten guidebook, and most recently, Praying in Time, the Hours and Days in Step with Orthodox Christian Tradition, a book that is now translated into Italian, Greek, and German. Sister Vasa is a Reservoir nun in uh, the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia. Dr. Pantelis Kalaitsidis is the director of the Volos Academy of Theological Studies. He has taught systematic theology at the Hellenic Open University and at St. Sergius Institute of Orthodox Theology in Paris. He has also been a research fellow at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox uh, School of Theology in Boston, at Princeton Theological Seminary and Princeton University in New Jersey, DePaul University in Chicago, and Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. He is serving as the editor of the series uh, Doxa and Praxis, Exploring Orthodox Theology for the World Council of Churches publications. He's a member of the scientific board of the Review of Ecumenical Studies in Romania, of the Orthodox Journal The Wheel, and the Journal of Orthodox Christian Studies uh, with John Hopkins University Press. Uh, Dr. Kalaitsidis is a member of the Executive Committee of the European Ac Academy of Religion, of the International Association of Orthodox Dogmatic Theologians, the American Academy of Religion, and the Society of Christian Ethics. He is also a co-chair of the Political Theology Group of the International Orthodox Theological Association, IOTA. Hello. Um, our next panelist, um, um, Father Cyril Hoverun. Father Cyril is a professor of ecclesiology, international relations, and ecumenism at Sankt Ignatius College in uh, University College of Stockholm, Sweden. He's also a director of Pathington Ecumenical Institute at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. Uh, Father Cyril is a graduate of the Theological Academy in Kyiv and National University in Athens. He uh, accomplished his doctoral studies at Durham University under supervision of Father Andrew Love. He was a chairman of the Department of, for External Church Relations of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and first deputy chair of the Educational Committee of the Russian Orthodox Church and later research fellow at Yale and Columbia Universities and the visiting professor at the University of Münster in Germany. He's an international fellow at Chester Browning Center for the Study of Religion and Public Life at the University of Alberta in Canada and an invited professor at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. A Google father, Cyril, and a lot is going to come up. Uh, okay. Our uh, next panelist is um, Father uh, Brandon Gallagher. Uh, Father Brandon is Associate Professor of Systematic Theology at the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. He was formerly a postdoctoral and research fellow at the University of Oxford, the University of Notre Dame in the USA, and Doshisha University in Kyoto, Japan. Uh, his publications include Freedom and Necessity in Modern Trinitarian Theology with Paul um, Ladiser, uh, The Patristic Witness of George Florovsky, Essential Theological Writings with Father John Chris of Gis, uh, The Living Christ, The Theological Legacy of George Florovsky. Uh, Father Brandon is currently co-editing 
Eastern Orth Orthodoxy and World Religions, the Theology and Practice of Interreligious Encounter in the Contemporary Christian East. He served in June 2016 at Crete, the Eastern Orthodox Holy and Great Council as a theological subject expert in the Ecumenical Patriarchate Press Office. He was one of the primary drafters of a declaration of the Russian on the Russian world, Ruski Mir teaching, uh, which was published, I think two years ago already on public uh, orthodoxy and received thousands of signatures of um, Orthodox thinkers and theologians. And uh, Father Brendan is a priest of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, uh, serving in the Archdiocese of Pietari in Great Britain. And last but certainly not least is uh, Father Deacon John Krisukis, uh, Father John is the Archdeacon of the Ecumenical Patriarchate. He was born in Sydney, Australia, and lives in Harpswell, Maine. Uh, he, following his studies at the Universities of Athens and Oxford, he co-founded St. Andrew's Theological College in Sydney in 1988, 1986, uh, pardon me, where he also taught at the University of Sydney. In 1995, he was invited to teach at the Holy Cross School of Theology in Boston, Massachusetts, where he taught until 2002. Since then, he serves as theological advisor to the Ecumenical Patriarch on environmental issues and senior advisor to the Department of Ecumenical Affairs in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. In 2023, he returned as professor of theology to Holy Cross School of Theology, where he was elected inaugural executive director of the Huffington Ecumenical Institute. So uh, very interestingly, we have two directors of the Huffington Ecumenical Institute from both uh, East and West Coast, which I think is marvelous. Thank you, Inga. Hi. Uh, his, uh, Father John's numerous publications focus on the early church and the desert tradition, as well as the, theo as the theology of the environment and the role of the church in the world. His latest books uh, include Creation as Sacrament, Reflections on Ecology and Spirituality, and the letters of Barsanufius and John, Desert Wisdom for Everyday Life. Thank you, Inga. Okay. Uh, let us proceed and hope for no more glitches. Again, apologies. Um, I would like us to begin uh, with a quick overview of the Russian world doctrine and the status of the World Council of the Russian people as a quasi-ecclesiastical assembly. Uh, now for everyone uh, who is on, uh, I'm going to add the panelists to the spotlight so that you are looking at all of them. Just find Antilis. Okay, um, and let's let's discuss this. Uh, what what this um, monster is and what it has produced. Uh, I would I would just like to introduce this topic by saying that it has become I think quite obvious that for almost three decades this assembly and the writings it's been producing were being dismissed um, as being marginal and unaffiliated with the church. And today um, we're witnessing this misconception as being paid for in blood, literally. So um, Father Cyril, would you like to begin uh, on this? <clears throat> sure, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this discussion. Uh, let me uh, uh, outline briefly uh, this monster, as you, as you said. 
Um, so basically speaking, uh, we could um, uh, differentiate between two, two kinds of two sorts of ideologies, uh, the proactive ideologies and reactive ideologies. The proactive ideologies are those who, those which um, articulate a system of a doctrine, uh, uh, a system of ideas that um, are designed to uh, encourage to move masses forward to, towards a goal, towards a purpose, an important social purpose. Uh, such a proactive ideology, for example, was Marxism, which was articulated as, as a system of thought and uh, continues to inspire a lot of people through this system of ideas. Reactive ideologies were usually those uh, that disagreed with the proactive ideologies and which uh, were not articulated clearly in the beginning, like, for example, the case of fascism. Fascism emerged uh, in Europe, uh, emerged as a uh, as a movement uh, to react to uh, to the left wing, -wing ideal proactive ideologies like Marxism, and they originally did not articulate themselves well. They, they did not explain themselves. It took, for example, for Mussolini approximately ten years from the from coming to power to actually saying what he believes to articulating. Uh, uh, what fascism is. I think he came to power in the early 20s and in the early 30s he published, for example, an article um, uh, of fascism in Encyclopedia Italiana where he explained what he, he, he is about. Uh, approximately the same period of time and approximately the same nature um, uh, has the uh, Russian uh, world doctrine. Um, it, is, it is reactive. Uh, it is uh, a reaction. It is a response to... Uh, uh, to what they believe it's like in the, the ideology of, of liberalism to liberalism, just like in the case of the classical fascism, for example. And it took uh, approximately two years, two years or so for the Russian world uh, ideology to start explaining itself, to start articulating itself. Um, uh, approximately 10 years ago, uh, I personally witnessed like the birth of this doctrine within the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, uh, it was like 2012 or so. And then uh, this ideology came to fruition, came to uh, uh, to inspire millions of people uh, really from, uh, from the church uh, to the wider Russian society and began to be articulated. So what we uh, witnessed recently with this uh, World Council, uh, uh, World People's Council, um, in in Moscow, uh, it was an attempt, a landmark, an important landmark in this articulation of uh, of the Russian world doctrine. Just like in the case, for example, of this Mussolini's article in Encyclopedia Encyclopedia Italiana, uh, or his book on fascism, written actually by uh, by Gentile, uh, uh, when the ideology which was brewing, which was kind of somewhere there underneath, and came to the surface eventually, started to be articulated. So we face the same process now with the Russian world doctrine in the case of the um, of the uh, Russian People's Council. Uh, so this is the body. <clears throat> it's a platform uh, which was established by the church for the purposes of the church. It's like a, an arm, a branch of the church, a political uh, platform, political arm of the church, as it were, which uh, whose purpose was originally different from what it is now. It started in the in the nineties exactly, and it started as um, a platform uh, of uh, dialoguing on the one hand with the uh, liberal uh, 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 the Russian society, which became liberal or liberated somehow, uh, and at the same time to create a sort of. I call it like a container for hazardous material, uh, because there were already some uh, very dangerous ideas and um, and uh, you know trends uh, 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 popping up here and there in in Russia. Some of them had uh, like this um, conservative um, conservative uh, attitude, uh, monarchist monarchist anti Semites, anti uh, liberals, uh, all those. Uh, radical ideas, which were marginal in the beginning, uh, the church, I believe, designed uh, a container to keep those dangerous ideas under control. <laughs> the church didn't want to actually to um, to boost them, to uh, feed them those ideas. The church wanted at the time to contain them, to keep them in a safe place where they would not be dangerous for the wider society. So the, I believe that was the idea, the original idea of the of the Russian People's Council, at least as I witnessed it, because I was in the Moscow Patriarchate at the time, quite inside, and uh, that's how I saw the things. Uh, so originally, a container for hazardous material. 
but eventually uh, all those ideas they evolved they developed in this container and they came out they became a mainstream uh, from marginal ideas they became a mainstream ideology uh, in the within the russian church and in the wider russian society and now the church uses uh, this platform of the Russian um, uh, uh, World Всемирный Русский Народный Собор, World Russian People Council. It's a it's a clumsy uh, 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 name in 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 English. Um, well, I would say it's it's clumsy in, in clumsy in Russian as well. Um, anyways, uh, the church uses this platform to uh, disseminate to propel those ideas from this hazardous con container. And then to uh, actually to articulate to improve those ideas, what uh, what has been done recently was that the church attempted at articulating the doctrine, which before that was quite nebulous, what was 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 quite um, uh, un, uh, ungraspable. Uh, so you could not really pin down before this uh, this doctrine. It was somewhere in the air. You understood what it was about, but it did not articulate itself clearly. Now this idea, ideology began articulating itself more clearly. And now we have a more or less uh, a picture of this ideology, which, which is not our design. It's not what us who criticize uh, the Russian world ideology that we design and, you know, and project upon them what they, they believe. No, it's not our construction, it's their construction. Now they started articulating themselves, constructing themselves this ideology. Now it's it, it's uh, it's it's much more clear what it is about. And now it's easier for those who criticize this ideology like us to deal with it. Um, and that's, uh, I hope, what we are going to do here in this session as well. So that would be my kind of take on um uh on on this phenomenon on this monster monster what is its genesis origins and uh, how it came uh, to be what it is thank you very much father zero um uh father brandon would you like to um add to that as also someone who has been studying the topic for a long time um well i think father Cyril has has um detailed it. I would just say, I mean, it it uh, it needs to be acknowledged that uh, this is something that is contradictory and and nebulous. Um, I, however, um, uh, my the first thing I would say to that, I, I decided to spend the afternoon preparing by reading the Epiphanes's Panarian, uh, which a um, uh, little bit of light reading before our our, our talk. And um, you'll find a, a sort of catalog of, of many different, what he calls sex. Uh, uh, and he identifies uh, heresy, not so much with a, a defined doctrine, but um, with a particular group, a particular sect or heretical group. And so um, I think that that needs to be said to those who would um, uh, say that because this is contradictory that it somehow uh, doesn't amount to a teaching as such but just to um highlight one aspect of what father Sidil said um it should be said that in this teaching um and i if i was to summarize there is a transnational sort of russian sphere or or civilization which uh has um uh, in particular a triunity this is the uh, or triune uh, sort of uh, um, collection of nations, uh, which would be the Russian Federation, Ukraine, and Belarus. But uh, often in the literature, they will throw in other nations for good measure. And uh, often it will involve wherever there are Russian speakers. It also holds um, uh, that the Russian world has a common political center, which would be Moscow and a common language. Hence, um, uh, very often you will encounter, uh, and I was encountering this 30 years ago when I joined the Orthodox Church, that Ukrainian is, is not uh, a real language. So a common language and um, a common spiritual center, Kiev, uh, the mother of all Rus. Uh, and they will go to the Russian primary chronicle as a sort of sacred scripture. And there is a common church, uh, and hence, going on and on and on about the canonical church in, in Ukraine, uh, almost turning this into an idol. And this canonical church with its common patriarch, who is uh, the patriarch Kirill of Moscow and all Rus, um, works in symphonia, in synergy, 
uh, um, with a, a common great leader, um, uh, and uh, this being Putin. And uh, if you look uh, at a lot of the various different things, they will often talk about uh, common moral values, common art, uh, um, common spiritual vision, um, even um, uh, I encountered in the past attempts to try to talk about a common monetary system, which uh, they would try to create as well. Um, and uh, there is a sacralization, obviously, of uh, a, a sort of a type of medievalism. So all of this um, uh, has been combined uh, uh, officially, and you see this in the recent statement. And the last thing I would um, uh, add to this is uh, I've noted, um, particularly within since the war, um, uh, is a strong apocalypticism, um, uh, something which is also common to many heretical sects um, uh, with this notion of the catechon. Um, uh, this notion that uh, Russia is, as it were, uh, the withholder, the restrainer to prevent, uh, as it were, um, the apocalyptic age and the age of the Antichrist. And um, with this um, comes, uh, and Father Cyril has written uh, very strongly on this, this almost Manichaean notion of seeing uh, the present age as one between the forces of light which uh, would be the Russian Federation and the Russian church and the forces of darkness, which are identified with the collective West. So um, I would say to those who still have doubts, because um, some of them may be saying at this moment, they may be saying, oh, well, you know, this is a marginal group. Uh, uh, it really doesn't reflect um, uh, the official definition of, of the church. Um, and um, would that orthodoxy was as simple uh, uh, as is such a vision of the church. But I would say that if, if um, the work of Epiphanius and Irenaeus and Hippolytus and all the various different heresiologists teach us anything, is that um, groups when they're left on their own to fester will just get weirder. And so I would think that it would not be too long before we see an official statement of, if not of the synod, um, uh, but perhaps even of, of, of some sort of council, official council of the church. So at this point, um, uh, I know that perhaps Sister Vasa, she had been mentioned as somebody who uh, might have something to say on this, and she has expertise. Uh Excuse me, I think Inga, you might want to say who goes next. Thank you, Brandon. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, Sister Vasa, please. I didn't realize that I muted myself, sorry. Well, hi, everyone. It's good to be here. Thank you so much to Inga and to The Wheel for uh, hosting this and for also inviting me uh, and to to my uh, fellow panelists, I also say hello. So uh, Inga, how many minutes do we have, each of us? Uh, well, everyone's uh, so far stayed within uh, five uh, for this topic, so. I'll, I'll try to do that as well. So uh, as for uh, this whole system of beliefs that indeed, uh, as Father Cyril said, was uh, articulated actually in something that does resemble finally, uh, a system, uh, uh, a world view, I would uh, say that it does uh, indeed, uh, you know, uh, sound like a heresy, smell like a heresy, uh, you know, uh, walk like a heresy, and so forth. Uh, and when it, you know, walks like a duck, acts like a duck, and so forth, uh, it's a duck. Uh, and uh, I think that because this is articulated uh, in words now, I mean, we see the fruits of it. We have seen so much bloodshed. Uh, the fruits of this, uh, this worldview, as incoherent as it was before, uh, this just chaos creating kind of a machine of aggression that we see unleashed on the people of Ukraine, uh, this has now been articulated, and it's been articulated in uh, chilling terms, I would say, 
uh, as um, uh, Father Brandon said, he pointed out the strange use of the word triune, uh, triidinly, is, uh, is a word construct that one hears in Russian only in reference to God, the triune God. We have the triune people in the so-called edict or the nakaz of uh, this uh, all world. It sounds even more um, sort of, it has more pathos in the Russian, Simirny, the all world council of the Russian people. It, I looked at it and I said, do you mean ecumenical? You know, and it does use the word uh, council uh, to describe this body of uh, both uh, ecclesial and state uh, representatives. I mean, the it's not only uh, the, the patriarch himself, who is the presider of this council. So you see this surrogate for a church council, but you have uh, members of the, the synod of the Russian Orthodox Church. You have uh, together in the presidium, uh, people like, uh, you know, Malafeyev, this, this uh, quote unquote orthodox uh, oligarch and, and founder of the Tsargrad uh, propaganda uh, channel. You have the Minister of Defense, uh, uh, Sergei Kozhugetovich, it's hard to pronounce, Shoigu. Uh, the you know the head of the armed forces uh, on uh, this uh, uh, council and all sorts of odious figures uh, like the the philosopher Dugin who comes out with all sorts of uh, very uh, you know like pagan and clearly uh, neo-fascist uh, statements and you have this body or council meeting in the the the, uh, the hall of councils of the main cathedral of Moscow of Christ the Savior, uh, you have the uh, the fact that the this uh, edict comes out uh, in a church that has not convened a church council since two thousand seventeen. Uh, so you have this aspect of being church in a different way. Uh, and you also have in the edict, alongside a lot of other statements and actions of Patriarch Kirill uh, throughout this war, uh, also before it, but uh, we can focus on the time of already all out war, uh, that uh, alongside the fact that on September 25th, uh, soon after the so-called partial mobilization in 2022, he did also announce uh, that uh, this strange idea, uh, I mean, it's, it's not that we've never heard it before in history, but that he announced that all sins will be washed away uh, of any soldier that uh, goes and completes his or fulfills his duty and uh, his oath, the patriarch likes to present us with the uh, supposed obligation to, to fulfill certain oaths, like the priestly oath or the, the soldier's oath, prisyaga. Uh, and he understands this to mean uh, that a spoken, uh, uh, some kind of uh, obligation to whomever it might be is something that is absolute. Uh, and uh, he understands uh, certain, you know, obligations of priests to have absolute obedience to uh, the human authority, even if it goes astray, whether it's in the church or in the armed forces or in, uh, you know, as citizens, there is a demand for absolute obedience to a, uh, to a very um, problematic and not godly authority that he demands. But alongside that, you have him uh, presiding over, getting back to the actual uh, so-called council. Uh, you have this uh, quote unquote council proclaiming, as Father Brandon said, uh, the triune people as specifically and uh, verbatim from this edict, which by the way is addressed to the Russian state, 
as a sort of instruction. Uh, it's saying that the the very highest value and meaning of life, no less, uh, is the the culture. The I don't have the text before me, uh, but uh, you know I can't stop seeing it in my dream, my nightmares. Uh, it's before me. Um, it, it's the the culture and the 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 closest it comes to saying that the the actual faith of this triune people is uh, the highest meaning. It says something like the the svetini the 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 holy the holy objects uh, you know relics sites what have you uh this is the highest meaning of life uh this culture the traditions of this triune people now nowhere in the document does it say uh that god you know the triune god or christ or the way of the cross or repentance, these basics of uh, the churches uh, and of, of the Christian, you know, ethos and uh, the actual symbolgestalt or the symbolic structure of what is uh, Orthodox Christian tradition. Nowhere uh, do we see the actual uh, meaning of these uh, of these uh, truths of uh, Orthodox Christianity being articulated here. We have them all replaced with a different way. We have a different way rather than repentance and the way of the cross that leads to life. We have the way of war. We have the way of a holy war. Uh, this uh, contradiction in terms is actually the unifying factor. It's been articulated before in hires up of the uh, whole uh, Putin regime, that the war has unified our people. The unifying factor that would be, in uh, Orthodox understanding, the mystery of the church. The church that is the unifying factor and the guarant of that unity is the person of Jesus Christ. We don't have any unity, in case anybody hasn't noticed. Uh, we don't have any unity outside of Christ. Uh, we we claim unity because we claim that we believe in the one. The triune God is the one where unity resides. We have our divisions uh, that are good for us, as St. Paul says, uh, our heresies, uh, that we become the dokimi, you know, or the, the, the ones tested and proven to be uh, reliable. Uh, but we are not unified through killing the others. We're not unifying through the aggression that is pro proclaimed to be the unifying thing. Sergei Viktorovich Lavrov recently said, or not so recently, a few months ago, he said how the war has unified our people. And uh, it's also, uh, if we read this document uh, carefully, said that holy war is actually not just inevitable, uh, it's vital for the actual life of the people. You know, what is necessary for the life of the world is uh, the cross and that leading to life in our understanding, but in the understanding of the document, it's it's uh, definitely echoing as uh, so importantly, uh, Sergei Shumila showed us in his, uh, in his articulation of what this is, uh, the justification of killing of others echoes uh, indeed Nazi, proclamations and understandings. And so the, were we to just have this document, as uh, Father Cyril uh, pointed out so helpfully, uh, you know, were we only to have what we had, uh, first of all, before, which was bits and pieces of this ideology, uh, we might not uh, recognize this uh, for what it is, uh, which is indeed a heresy that is defined in various ways, but in the ways that we find it defined uh, in our uh, tradition and that which has influenced our traditional understanding of it uh, is that it is a difference, as St. Basil puts it in his first canon, a difference in the very faith in God. Instead of God, 
we have erected in the place of God uh, this triune people, even using the language of uh, Trinitarian theology. And we have a different way than is presented to us. As we all know, Christianity was simply known as the way. Uh, and the way we see here is aggression. Uh, you know that uh, three sections of this document, uh, well, maybe even more, ha are, exp are dedicated to articulating how uh, the dangers come from foreigners, whether it's the migrants that come into Russia. Uh, these need to be checked. Uh, we, we have this, instead of Christ, uh, you know, and his word being the light of revelation to the Gentiles, also the glory of the people Israel, that this encompasses everyone. We have this elitist uh, sense of uh, the, a certain nation. We have its right to kill being proclaimed. And we also have uh, an expression like the, the cult of the family. Uh, cult simi is actually used here. The cult of the family is proclaimed to be a thing for this triune people. We don't have family values of, of any sort or the cult of family in in a faith based on someone who chose to come into this world into a non-traditional family construct like this this betrothal of a virgin uh, to uh, to Joseph, um, we uh, we as we know uh, family values as much as people would like to see them as a Christian thing, and that's a thing uh, for something like the mafia. You know, the Casa Nostra has family values as family first, but certainly family building and, and family is not what comes first to those uh, called not by man, but by God, or not of, uh, of the flesh, um, but of God. So we know these things, and I'm not going, going to annoy you with reviewing them. I just have one uh, more thing, that uh, the, the situation that we are in, that also has used and weaponized canonicity to hold hostage to even uh, heretical uh, church leaders, uh, our church, to value communion and union with them as if our canonicity can uh, guarantee or in any way manifest e even uh, unity instead of our Lord Jesus Christ when we want to maintain this kind of unity, as I sometimes sense our uh, beloved, uh, you know, church leaders would like to do, to maintain unity at any cost with patriarchy, regardless of what he's saying, regardless of the bloodshed this is causing, regardless of the destruction, actually, if we look at the fruits, the destruction of unity in our church, the, the trampling, of say uh, even the most ancient of the patriarchates in uh, Africa and just we have this we have like a wild horse loose in a hospital if I could put it this way there's a wild horse loose in our hospital and we're uh, somehow uh, not wanting to do something about it um, even though it's actually being anti uh, that which the church is meant to serve uh, that is to foster unity, to uh, to serve uh, yeah. one master, um, but we are held hostage to canonicity, which seems to guarantee grace for our people. Our people are taught to fear, as I just recently uh, had an exchange on on social media, where a priest had used the term in a in a sermon. Uh, if we fear the loss of grace, then we're on the right path. We, that's a very strange thing to fear the loss of grace. It's not up to us which gifts God sends us. We're, we're taught the fear of God and the fear of, of losing communion with him, but it's up to him what he does with grace 
if, if we are like children who are only looking into the hands of our parents, waiting for what gifts they give us, um, then we have not uh, ceased to be children and not grown up because we seek communion with God. But what he gives us, you know, uh, is, is up to him. We can't control grace, but it seems like there is a whole, there's this whole, uh, you know, there's canonicity as the highest thing and expression of church being rather than fidelity and profession of the truth about God. Uh, our episcopate is supposed to be uh, serving the word and Professor, being... I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you but you have actually gotten into every topic on the agenda so we will uh, uh, and thank you very much for uh, your contribution we will uh, circle back to that I would like to um, ask uh, Father John to um, circle a little bit back to perhaps the original topic of the uh, Russian world and then um, uh, Pantelis, um, uh, I, I know, would like to develop uh, some remarks on on the teaching and the heresy of uh, and whether it or not it is a heresy. Father John. Thank you, Inka, and thanks for organizing this. Uh, thank you for insisting that I come on. I had said no at first, but uh, after the reaction to my article, I thought maybe it should be a good thing uh, for me to come on, uh, to be with friends. This is Lent. I would like to think we're friends. Um, I would like to think we're all on the same page in some ways. We're all on the same side here. We tend to forget simply because one or another argument is proposed. Uh, we're, we're all frustrated. We're hampered by the same constraints. You know, we 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 want Kirill held accountable. And the sad thing is he may never be. And that's, that's really hard for us to digest. Um, I acknowledge, I share with all of you the pain, the injustice, the wrong that's wrought by Kirill. I loathe that. And I understand why it's so emotional for all of us, me included. We're justified in reacting. We want to fly Ukrainian flags against Kirill's aggression. We want to condemn his teaching. We want to, we want to be part of a cause. But it's actually harder to be part of a dialogue. We, we tend to latch on to things. And so I, I feel you've that you feel I've sort of rained on your parade here. That's not, that's not what I'm doing. This is going to Father Cyril's beautiful explanation of the development of this uh, teaching through the People's Council, which I learned about through Serhi Shumilo's um, article um, in The Wheel, uh, how all this moved from a marginal thing to center stage. Um, and that's where the problem is. And that's where I come in with the argument of politics rather than heresy. Um, Father Cyril, you did mention that the Russian world is now articulated more clearly. And uh, Sister Vasa mentioned the bloodshed, the, the, the aggression, the war, um, the holy war. Um, Brandon mentioned the, the nebulous sort of the nature of it uh, beforehand. Well, I honestly believe that the reason we're having this conversation today is not theology. I really don't think it's ideology. It's the war. It's the invasion. It's the geopolitical situation. And we want to try and shoehorn theology through the label of heresy or whatever into a political conflict. It's just my opinion. And it's not like I disagree that you can talk about heresy here. But we want, we think this panel is about theology. We wouldn't be having it if it wasn't for the war. We wouldn't be having it if it wasn't for the bombs. Even the use of the word heresy is driven by politics. If there wasn't a war, 
if there was only Kirill's refusal to accept Bartholomew's primacy, if there was only Kirill's refusal to accept the Great Council because of Ruski Mir or because of Third Rome, no one would blink an eye. It's a tug of war. It's not a theological debate. And there's no shortcut. The politics is messy. But I think the politics is what has to be addressed. We are on the same side. And what we do is, Father John Baer said, you can't hold a, you know, a bully accountable. Okay, so we recognize we can't do much except raise the flag of heresy. We try to make a political statement using our conventional terminology to express our grievance. I share your frustration and your aspiration, but I'm not looking for theological answers just to feel like I'm doing something. I'm equally frustrated. I just believe the heresy line is well, not the only line, first of all, not the best line necessarily, maybe even futile. Otherwise, I would send my spiritual reflections to Patriarch Kirill. I think we have to engage with the politics. It's different for Ukraine. It's different for you, Father Cyril. If you're telling me it helps, it's valid, it's valuable to use this this label, heresy, I get it. But for me, again, for me, it doesn't mitigate the suffering. I would argue, engage in the politics. Engage in a conversation about morality. Take the side of justice. But do more than preach. Do something that I feel has an impact. Not many Orthodox churches have responded. E even, even the ones that have condemned Patriarchate of Alexandria condemned Ruski Mir, didn't touch the word heresy. So it's my humble belief, my, my firm belief, though, that the heresy label is not as crushing or devastating as we might imagine for Kirill, for the Orthodox, and certainly for the world. For me, and I know you'll kick, but it's a kind of finger wag wagging it it's us talking among ourselves in a hermetically sealed discourse that doesn't even come close to capturing Kirill's corruption and criminality and bloodshed he's going to hell that's good theology just leave it at that he's going to hell with his mitre but his aggression is political in essence political in nature and i think politics should be the focus um otherwise if you're talking heresy it's fine but it's a little more complicated than i don't know dioscorus and epiphanius and even manichaeism and dualism it's a little more than that go get back to the crimes of putin that are backed by kirill and condemn that that's what i'd like to see Thank you, Father John, and uh, I'd, like, I'd like to think that uh, Pace has done, uh, has tried to do that, but uh, I think that's a subject of um, a further conversation. Um, I would love uh, right now to uh, invite uh, Pantelis to um, present his remarks uh, following the, um, the, the topic. Uh, thank you, Ina. Uh, thank you, all the panelists and uh, uh, the people who, uh, with great interest, uh, take part in this uh, panel discussion. As I explained to Inka and to my uh, and to other panelists, as I'm completely uh, in a different mood at uh, this moment, I made uh, the choice to use all my time uh, using a statement I wrote in order to uh, make more systematic my approach. So I will use all my time uh, to approach mainly the issue of heresy. And then during the discussion, I will uh, formulate some, uh, some remarks. So um, let me begin my statement with a personal confession. 
as I have argued many times, both in my lectures and in my papers and books, I maintain that religious nationalism seems to be the most serious problem in the Orthodox Church since the fall of Byzantium and the period of introversion which began with this crucial historic event. Uh, I, for, I forgot to mention that in order to facilitate uh, people who attend this, uh, this panel discussion, uh, I'm sharing my text uh, in the screen. So significant aspects of this problem are the identification between church and nation, church and ethno-cultural identity, church and state, and consequently, the idea of national churches, each of which identifies the truth of the faith with the truth of the nation and claims for every single Orthodox nation the role of the new chosen people of God, alongside with the replacement of the history of salvation with the history of national revival. By assuming this national role and by being involved in the formation of particular ethno-cultural identities, the Orthodox, the Orthodox Church faces serious difficulties in confirming its sense of Catholicity, universality and church unity. While in the context of a multinational postmodern pluralistic society, the church is exhausting the theological and spiritual resources of its patristic tradition on the rhetoric of identities and on a deity, religious, tribalism, and fundamentalism. I spent 20, 23 years of my life writing theological studies and essays on and fighting against Orthodox nationalism first and foremost against Greek religious nationalism, as I believe that there is nothing more redemptive and liberating than self-criticism. I spoke against Greek religious nationalism in terms of the temptation of Judas, of the replacement of baptismal by ethnocultural community, of culturalistic slide, of ecclesiastical neocolonialism for the case of the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Jerusalem, of ethnocultural hermeneutics, of identity drift, and the instrumentalization of the faith for the sake of the state and the nation. There is a quotation from my paper on the temptation of Judas, but I will skip it in order to keep time. By doing so, I have been accused in my own country that by placing the issue of religious nationalism high in my agenda, I got myself the opportunity to be invited in international conferences and to travel all around the world. I was hoping, nevertheless, that other Orthodox theologians in other Orthodox countries or settings would follow the same path and would dare to criticize their own church and their countries. I was apparently wrong in my expectations, why I couldn't imagine that all this effort to make the universal character of Orthodox nationalism more clear would serve to some as an excuse to justify the full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine, as well as to minimize and banalize the scandalous dogmatic and theological deviation underlying the Russian war teaching. Uh, Two years ago, when we published the Declaration of Orthodox Theologians of the Russian War Teaching, an important number of European ecumenists, Catholic, Catholics and Protestants, specialized in Orthodoxy, who kept their eyes closed and tolerated Russian ecclesial and theological expansionism for years, tried to minimize the importance of the Russian war in regard to the war in Ukraine and claim that the Russian war theory was a marginal element within the Russian church. Now, after the publication of the Edict of the Russian War by the War Russian People, a popular council last March, and its clear connection with the specific military operation and the whole war against Ukraine and the collective West, the focus has been shifted to the heretical character of the Russian war teaching. Thus, I have no choice but to also focus my statement on this point. But before doing so, let me first clarify some points. 
it is true that ethnotheology and religious nationalism have, have pervaded the whole of orthodoxy. It is a cancer that, with few exceptions, has contaminated all Orthodox churches, as it has also affected other Christian churches, both Catholic and Protestant. The whole Russian world idea and the, and the way it has been implemented meet the, the main criteria of ethnotheology, that is the preeminence of the political and national element over the ecclesial, the uniqueness of Russia as a Christian civilization, and the understanding of faith in terms of culture, civilization, and ancestral heritage, as well as the inversion of the paradoxical and antinomic relationship between eschatology and history, or the oblivion of the biblical in the world, but not of the world, for the sake of the world. Yet, as suggested by many, the ideological basis for the Russian aggression in Ukraine is the Russian world theory, a mixture of ethnophiletist and civilizational nationalism that promotes and defends the unity, ignoring the internationally recognized borders, so the unity of Russia, Belarusia, Ukraine, Moldova, and Kazakhstan, yet, yet with a clear Russian predominance what they usually call the Holy Russ. One can object that the Russian world ideology is not the first or the only case of Orthodox nationalism or ethnotheology. In fact, in a recent paper of mine entitled Orthodox Theology Challenged by Balkan and East European Ethnotheologies, which came out in a collected volume published by Brill Schenning, I have studied five cases of Orthodox ethnotheology those of Father Dumitrus Stanilouai, Father John Romanides, Christos Yanaras, the late Serbian hierarchs, Metropolitan Amphilochia Radovic and Bishop of Herzegovina, Athanasia Yeftic, and the Russian word ethnotheological ideology. These versions of ethnotheology are surprising and even awkward for their ethno-religious or cultural pride and the sense of ethno-cultural greatness for the glorification, respectively, of the Romanian or the Byzantine Hellenic people and culture, as well as for the aggressive anti-Westernism and also anti-Semitism in Stanilo I's case, and the praise of Orthodox isolationists. Nevertheless, and here is the critical and decisive point and the crucial difference, the three of them, that is Stanilo I, Romanides, Yanaras, remained at a level of a self-sufficient, self-justifying discourse and a romantic self-exaltation rhetoric and were not actively involved in any kind of violent or aggressive acts in wars and crimes. Unfortunately, this was not the case with the late Serbian hierarchs during the time of the wars in former Yugoslavia and even more with the Russian world ideology and patriarch Kirill was, who was involved or theologically justified violent acts, wars, crimes against humanity, and even genocides. In fact, for the first time in the history of the Orthodox Church, Patriarch Kirill and the Russian Orthodox Church, that fully subscribed to the Russian world ideology, justified theologically the violence and the aggressive war while they did not hesitate to use the terminology of holy war and of metaphysical struggle. Yet, can we really justify a war that is fought in the name of God? Do we have the right to say that we are fighting a war in the name of God? I know that there are historical examples that legitimize wars in the name of God, but these wars have faced theological criticism. There have been the teaching and writings of the fathers of the church that guide us and tell us that one cannot conduct war in the name of God, as well as contemporary Orthodox theologians and eminent prelates and hierarchs who unequivocally condemn war, especially war committed in the name of God. His Old Holiness, the Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, for example, does not hesitate to affirm that I quote, war in the name of religion is war against religion, end of the quote. While more recently, he repeatedly wrote and spoke against the Russian world ideology. 
Bishop George Hodr, the former Orthodox Metropolitan of Mount Lebanon, in a text uh, entitled To Kill is to Deny God, give, gives us a profound theological reflection on the issue at hand. I quote now George Hodr, and I translate myself from French. To kill is to deny God completely. It is to deny his very existence as the giver of life. We kill the other person because we consider that he or she interferes with our plans, interests, patients, or freedom, and all that goes with it. In doing so, we decide that we are the only ones who should decide. Consciously or unconsciously, we want to take the place of God. God becomes an idol if we kill for him. The individual believes himself to be God's yet unknown in collective murder. The one who wants to be the defender of the holy nation called by some Uma and by other ecclesia. Through moral or physical violence, the holy nation is transformed into a sociological group. Countries where mentalities have not been secularized, those who conduct civil war believe they are fighting a metaphysical struggle. This passage illustrates exactly what we have been experiencing during the Russian invasion of Ukraine and radically desacralizes any modern understanding of religious wars. In this context, we can also refer to the well-known canons, canons of the Eastern Church, specifically those of St. Basil, which forbid the giving of communion to soldiers who have killed even during defensive wars or which forbid priests who have blood on their hands to celebrate the divine liturgy. And we can also take an example from the Byzantine period when during the reign of Emperor Nikiforus Phokas, the warriors and soldiers of the empire who fell in the fight against Islam were denied the status of saints of the church. In all these cases, there is a clear distinction between sacrifice for the neighbor and sacrifice or, or death of the brother, between Eucharistic communion and belligerent spirit, between the saints of the church and the heroes sacrificed to defend the emperor, between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Caesar, the state or the nation. In order to make clear the difference between the truth of the gospel and the genuine Orthodox tradition on the one hand and heretical or distorted teachings on the other. Let me refer to one more recent example, that of a modern witness of the Orthodox faith, the late Patriarch Paul of the Serbian Orthodox Church. What should retain our attention here is the ethno-religious conflicts culminating in the war and crimes in the former Yugoslavia in which Orthodox people and even clerics were involved, crimes often committed in the name of God and for the defense of the Orthodox faith, and which marked the end of the age of innocence for Orthodoxy. During the whole decade of the 90s, 1990s, Orthodox people in the former Yugoslavia faced terrible dilemmas and crucial questions, mainly regarding the fidelity to the gospel commandments and the survival of the Serbian people in its historic cradles. In many cases, the defense of the nation was the priority, while the theological justification of war and violence was accompanied by the instrumentalization of religion for the sake of the national cause. His Holiness Paul, the Serbian Orthodox Patriarch of that time, this humble and ascetic spiritual figure who against his own will found himself at the head of the Serbian church, intervened many times with sermons, teaching at the church, personal advice, encyclical letters, public statements, interviews, and press releases to condemn violence and atrocities of all sides, the Serbian included, to remind the absolute primacy of God and gospel commandments over any other worldly claim, to praise forgiveness and love for enemies, to stand at the side of the victims, to highlight the eternal value of or dignity of every human being as image of God, regardless of his or her religion, race or ethnic origin. 
as noticed by Jean-Claude Larsay in his book on, on Patriarch Paul, and I quote Larsay here, when many of his compatriots were carried away by the absurdity of war and blighted by nationalists, even justifying certain atrocities committed by their own people, Patriarch Paul always condemned any form of violence by anyone and systematically took the side of the victims, whoever they were, exhorting us to love our enemies and recognizing that this Christian ideal is for most people impossible to achieve. He tirelessly uh, urged at least the application of the biblical commandment do to not do to no one what you yourself hate. End of quotation. Patriarch Paul did not support any Serbian party, not even Serbia, but he was on the side of the victims, wherever they were, in a statement published by the extraordinary synod of the Serbian hierarchy in December 1992, the Patriarch stated the following, and I quote, we sympathize with the suffering of every human being as if it were our own. All tears, all wounds, physical or moral, and every drop of blood said are fraternal tears, fraternal wounds, and fraternal blood. End of quotation. He did not silence the Serbs' atrocities, nor did he consider them negligible, but condemned them just as he did for the atrocities of the opponent nations. He once made the following public statement, I quote again, it is neither human nor Christian to defend a crime, and it would be an unforgivable sin to justify crimes because they are committed by persons of uh, your own people. As human beings and Christians, but also as leaders of the Orthodox Church, who have always named and condemned every criminal act and have never used special criteria for crimes and criminals according to their religion or ethnicity. End of quotation. With regard to this attitude toward neighboring peoples with whom the Serbs were in a state of war and caused them much suffering, the Patriarch be beget the Serbian people to preserve in practice uh, to preserve in patience and Christian forgiveness and generosity toward all people. Patriarch Paul recalled how Christ called us to love our enemies because this love is the highest expression of Christian love as it is absolutely selfless. He did not forget to pray for the enemies of, the, of his people. He composed special prayers and added them to the final prayers of the liturgical service services in order to motivate the faithful to love by the grace of God, their enemies, and to lead to repentance those who had given into feelings of hatred. How far is Patriarch Kirill and the ideology of the Russian world by the above ecclesial and gospel-inspired figures of our time, such as ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, Metropolitan George Hodr or Patriarch uh, Paul of Serbia. An ideology, I mean the Russian world, an ideology that never refers to Christ and his gospel, that depersonalizes and despises the human person and the image of God in it, that hates the neighbor and does not tolerate the other and the different, that, equ that equates the perpetrators with the victims, that chooses as its targets children, women, and weak old people, and erects the evil to the status of canonicity. I wonder what can be more heretical than the replacement of theology by ideology, as the title of this very panel suggests, and wonder about the theological and ecclesial criteria of people who try to convince us that the Russian world ideology is not a heresy, and who, by their attitude, contribute unwillingly, apparently, to the banalization of evil and the sacralization of the false world th uh, theory. Thank you for your attention. 
and of course, I'm open to discussion or to questions. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation, Pantelis. Uh, we're getting uh, we're getting very close to um, the uh, uh, discussion part of um, our panel with um, with the many participants. Uh, so I, uh, I kind of suspected that we will not get through the entire agenda in time, but uh, I uh, would like to know uh, if any of the panelists uh, has um, anything to suggest uh, on the um, on what what do we do with all that you know I'm looking at uh, at this uh, esteemed group at people who are participating uh, as registrants there's um, you know there's clergy here um, uh, academics, theologians, there's a lot of clergy and uh, what and, and yet we all know that uh, the synods of the world are you know, just waiting out essentially uh, this whole uh, disaster that is unfolding um, with the direct blessing of the church. So yes, Father Soro, please. Uh, yes, thank you. I just wanted to briefly uh reflect on what has been said because apparently there is like a clash of interpretations it's not the, it's not a clash of uh of uh, our judgment regarding what is going on in ukraine i think we are absolutely on the same page uh but then uh we uh diverge in um in in answering the question so what what's next what what needs to be done uh and i think we need uh well, first of all we need uh probably to uh to make it clear to ourselves and to and to others that we are on the same page we uh see uh, the things synoptically uh, the the war in ukraine the uh the underpinning uh the underpinnings of this war we recognize we acknowledge that there is such a thing as a russian world ideology we acknowledge that it's dangerous uh, then we may disagree on uh what sort of taxonomy we need to place this ideology to and whether this is a political taxonomy or it's a theological taxonomy or it's a hybrid, a mixed taxonomy. Uh, speaking about taxonomy, if I may uh, briefly, uh, I promise, uh, add uh, something that uh, may help us. And uh, I, 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 uh, I'll try, I, I'll suggest to uh, apply this scholastical approach uh, to this Russian world ideology. Let us be scholastical a bit. So speaking in terms of um, the Aristotelian logics, dialectics that help helped us in the past to develop our own doctrine i think the same dialectics is applicable applicable to our conversation here and aristotle as you know he uh, differentiated between the general things and more uh, and more particular things he expressed the most general things as as genera or tageni genus and more particular things like taidi idos the species and i suggest to consider all the heresies uh, in the same terms, like there is a genus, a uh, genus uh, of uh, of all heresies, and we acknowledge that they are bad, they are dangerous, they need to be named, they need to be uh, addressed uh, by the church. And then within this genus of heresies, we certainly can distinguish several idi or species of heresies. There are some classical heresies like uh, Arianism, uh, like uh, Eutychianism and Historianism, and you name them, they are related to the Trinity, to the incarnation of God. Then uh, before the fourth century, there was a special idos uh, kind of heresies which were addressed by, well, Father um, Anastasius mentioned, uh, Irenaeus of Lyon, all those Manichaean Gnostic, a bunch of Gnostic heresies, as it were. And then there was a, a, a bunch and idos of heresies which were addressed in the modern era, including the heresy that was addressed, uh, that was mentioned by Pandelis in his presentation, the uh, ethnophiletic heresies, ethnophilitism. So it's like more a political uh, sort of heresies which, uh, which were addressed starting in the 19th century. And uh, I believe that uh, the Russian world ideology uh, fits this sort of idos this species of heresies. It, it is in the same uh, uh, bucket with uh, ethnophilitism and other, uh, other uh, similar heresies. So essentially, uh, the council 1872 in Constantinople that condemned ethnophilitism, condemned it as a heresy, 
the council introduced a new kind of heresies and named them as heresies. And uh, uh, we are still dealing with exactly the same sort of heresies even in our days. And the council in Cree, the Panorthodox Council 2016, confirmed the Council of uh, Constantinople and confirmed that ethnophilitism is not just, you know, a political problem, but it's also a theological problem. So I think we, uh, it, it may help us if we categorize, if we taxonomize heresies according to those Aristotelian category, uh, categories, it may help us to come up with our own decision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Ciro. Uh, uh... Father Brenton, and then we will go to um, uh, the larger group. Um, I guess I, I would just say um, two things. The first thing is um, there is a great danger um, that um, either that heresy um, and theology sort of swallows up all of life, and uh, as it were, you look for um, to adapt an English phrase, heresy under bushes. Uh, um, you know, that, uh, and you see this sometimes, um, unfortunately, with many ultra conservative orthodox groups. This is a real danger. One has to acknowledge this. The other danger is that heresy becomes uh, a museum piece and that we, uh, as it were, um, separate theology from life as if um, uh, politics um, uh, and our political opinions never came into it. Uh, this, um, I would think, uh, is an attempt uh, or could be an attempt to try to, as it were, um, preserve um, the church from the vagaries of, of the political winds uh, and, as it were, um, preserve what is precious to us um, and try, as it were, to keep our orthodoxy away from things that could de destroy it, could sully it. Um, and this is also, I think, uh, a danger. But if we all um, do think that this uh, is something which could be categorized as a, as a heresy, perhaps of the second sort that Father Cyril uh, identified, um, and indeed uh, there is good reason to see that it distorts in multiple areas, um, beginning with um, the understanding of soteriology, as uh, Sister Vasa has uh, pointed out in regard to uh, salvation, uh, extending into the doctrine of God, um, going into the church, uh, in terms of multiple different um, what theologians call loci. Um, uh, then the next thing comes into play. And this, I wonder, is what we're really afraid of. If the, um, this is being taught at the highest level by those who rightly divide the word of God's truth by the primate, and um, uh, an Orthodox Church is a body which is linked in communion through its bishops. And then we must um, uh, ask, is the Russian Orthodox Church any more part of the Orthodox Church? Is it a sect, as uh, Epiphanius uh, said? Is it something, as it were, that needs to be catalogued uh, amongst uh, the Manichaeans, amongst uh, all these various different groups. And this, I think, for all of us is a rather terrifying uh, thing to contemplate, but it needs to be contemplated because there is a direct connection between Orthodox faith and communion. And we, we, all of us, all us um, ri um, rightly thinking Orthodox intellectual liberals in this room are affected, we are implicated by the false teaching, by the heretical teaching of Kirill. Because in one way or another, we are in communion with him. We are bonded with him. We are implicated by his teaching. And therefore, for the protection of the faith and for the very character of communion, we must ask, is this indeed a heresy? And if we think so, we need to put that to our bishops. This is why it is not a political matter. It is a matter of the very life of our Orthodox communion. It is a matter of communion as being as communion. You cannot, as it were, skirt history as uh, the blessed in memory, Metropolitan John Zazulis sometimes did, uh, and as it were, live in the time to come, in the age to come. One must live in this world 
and protect the identity and the bounds of the church. Heresy is needed. It is needed for our um, being a body which is in communion and preaches the Orthodox faith. This is why it is not politics, but life. Thank you, Father Brenton. Uh, Father John, I know you uh, wanted to reply and, okay, I'll, I'll use my executive privilege to allow that and then we will get to the further discussion. So I, I, Inga, thank you. I mean, I want to make it clear, I'm not taking issue with the heresy argument. It's in my article, first paragraph, even calling it justified and justifiable calling those who argue this my friends though that's been criticized as patronizing um i get it i really do get it but and 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 if i get it honestly it's not a matter of telling me more loudly what you're trying to say or more slowly maybe it's not a matter of reminding me what heresy means again or dioscorus or maybe if we go back to ignatius and Irenaeus, or it's not a matter of criticizing Greek seminaries altogether for not knowing canon law. I've been dealing with apotichismos probably for four decades now, and uh, I know how the patriarch reacts to this term. Um, it's not news, pandelis, you, you must have heard this in Greece all the time. Apotichismos is not a, some recent discovery of a loophole. Part of this part of working if we're working together has to include if you're asking how do we move from here inga has to Im include some civil conversation as well i mean the the last couple of days the orchestrating of responses the threatening from people we're going to write not only are we going to write someone else is going to write people unfriending people on facebook i mean I don't know. I think this is the reason I joined this um, panel today, because it's Lent. We should maybe consider other options. Honestly, Pandelis, you wonder about the theological and ecclesiastical uh, criteria of those who contribute to the Holy War. Really? I mean, if Kirill's heresy is all about hubris, maybe we need to look at ourselves as well. Um, I mean, I know friends of yours that tell me they've been cut off from your circle because they don't buy into the heresy thing. Why do people have to buy into it? All I'm saying is, academically, theologically, we might actually be oversimplifying the inherent complexity of her heresy when we mold it to meet our needs. We can propose patristic visions. That's what we do as theologians. That's how we get paid. We can provide canonical loopholes. We can restructure the scaffolding of the church. We can introduce or remind people that there's an image of church as mother, not just father. But I hate to break it to you. We are a church. We're a hierarchical church. All of our churches have at their head a patriarch that's gotta tell you something remember the institutions that we're talking about they put kirill there in the first place that's where the focus should be so we're not arguing differently when brandon says we're in this world that's what i'm saying use the categories of this world why do you have to put in religious categories to feel better I mean, Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, talks about Jesus whenever he speaks. Why do we have to do that? We need to work together, not by undermining one another, together toward a greater accountability of bishops and synods. I think that's what Father Cyril does. I think that's what Father Baird does. I think it's what I'd like to think I do. But I would argue we have to admit where and where we are as church first and i think we're all we are all stigmatized by ethnophilitism but using the word hierarchy is not going to help i really don't think it's going to help maybe patriarch bartholomew will do it someday in which case it'll help right now 
he's commemorating Kirill. And people say to me, oh, you're leaving it to the bishops. Actually, I'm not. I, I'm afraid that you're leaving it to the bishops when you're waiting for them to condemn. Why aren't they listening? That's what we should be asking. You know, maybe I'm kind of glad Bartholomew doesn't rush to condemn Russia. If the, if the last two days are any indication, I'm glad we're not the ones that decide over that. And that's what I meant by maybe leave some things to bishops. And I'm not saying leave Kirill to the church about forgiveness, but I'm afraid that's what we might be doing if we're pushing. Brandon, you've been pushing for years. This has to be signed by bishops. This has a little bit of humility goes a long way, especially in Lent. Just leave some things alone or do other things. The, the pace, the what is it, the Council of Europe, they talk about wars. Why don't you, we should have been condemning the war with thousands of signatures, not talking about heresy. I just think we miss the boat if we do. And if you throw heresy around, Kirill thinks you're heretics. He thinks I'm a heretic. We're going, the whole West is heretical. Not just Thomas Bremer is asking the question. Everyone in the West, he's <laughs> heresy, depravity, corruption. So if you want to talk about heresies, I would say, don't just think dualism, Father Cyril. What about monophysitism? That'll blow my Oriental friends off, which is rejecting the human, reducing the human, just talking about the heavenly part, the spiritual part, the heretical part. We are citizens of heaven, but predominantly, we're citizens of this world. That's where I'd like to see. I'd like to see him in jail, not really being upset at our document. Thanks. I think that there is consensus in that department. I would say among the participants. Okay, I have I have to apologize, but panelists, you will have a chance to respond because. But I really would like to have some people who have been putting uh, questions and comments in the chat to participate. So uh, Olga um, Mayerson, uh, please. You turn your... Yes, I put I put a couple of points in the chat, one of them to Father John. Uh, uh, in view of your response, Father John, I think that it's immensely important uh, to agree upon what we mean by the word. Essentially, you objected against using it as a hostile label, but it actually, uh, uh, heresy, I mean, but it seems to me uh, like throwing it around, like mutual blames, but I think there's something more to it. And uh, because the reason, the impetus for this panel altogether is that heresies are about surrogates. They replace Christ with uh, para-Christian notions. Uh -huh. And that is why it's so important to consider this doctrine as a heresy. Because, for example, as Sister Vasa says, it replaces the triune God with the triune uh, national, you know, group, whatever it be, legitimate or not. Uh, it, re it, it begins to justify all sorts of things in uh, uh, the place of what, again, Vasa uh, cast as Svetinki. Uh, not, uh, she said Svetinki, but actually the pejorative, the derogatory term is svetinki, the little tiny idols that replace uh, uh, both uh, sacraments of the church and Christ himself as their center. And I think that from that point of view, as no, uh, violetism is a very important issue, very important. Uh, of course, it, it, uh, the doctrine against it, 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 I think it does immense honor to Constantinople that they came up with this notion because my other point was about uh, its roots in Byzantium. You know, because that's how it all started and how it started uh, labeling and persecuting the non-Calcedonian churches. There were plenty of linguistic, cultural, and political reasons for that, etc. So I was, uh, and I think the the, the pre paper of Pantelis was absolutely brilliant because it addressed that problem. My only question on that front, actually, whether uh, Pantelis or in general, is 
to put it in computer programmer's terms, is it a bug or a feature of orthodoxy? In other words, is it uh, uh, perhaps inevitable that a church that's not centered around Rome or any other kind of uh, international and or pan-national uh, vicarage of Christ, to put it in the most anti-Roman terms, you know, uh, whether it's inevitable that the local churches would start um, the uh, uh, would capitalize on the traditions that kind of sacralize uh, the national, uh, not just for the Russians or the Greeks. I have encountered in my life. I have tons of friends, for example, among Georgians. And uh, uh, the problem seems to be pervasive internally. I have many friends among the non-Calcedonians, uh, especially Armenians and Ethiopians. And it's the exact same problem. In other words, people are not aware of uh, what, <laughs> what makes us special, you know? Uh, and when they come to uh, try to come up with it, the whole problem of the heresy of ethnophilogism becomes very prominent, extremely relevant, because they begin to, you know, orthodoxy kind of, the biggest problem with it is that it's prone to deify local traditions because it is so big on tradition. I know I come from Judaism, you know, and this is what prevented Christ's universality to begin with. So tradition is all beautiful as long as it doesn't become a dogma. The moment it becomes a dogma, the whole doctrine turns into a heresy, precisely because it it, it is a surrogate for Christ. Uh, so to me, it's it's very relevant. I think. I mean, I I'm extremely happy that this panel is actually about what's wrong with the Russian world theologically. Uh, uh, it is it is it's not because to me heresy is a kind of a swear word or a label or something to. Uh, condemn someone, you know, God knows I'm not no Justinian. In fact, it's not my favorite character by any, uh, uh, by any, in any terms. But I think it's, it is really important that any surrogates for Christ is spiritually dangerous. And that's what makes people, uh, what puts the ideas that going to war for the just cause is good. You know, I, I've been raised in a pseudo-religious society. In a, in, a, in a society of religious surrogates, I was born and raised early, my early years past in the Soviet Union. I know what it means to create a cult out of, uh, uh, well, essentially, you know, the reason I married my husband, for example, is because he had held nothing sacred except for Christ. And I still value him for that, for that very reason. But uh, it's a very slippery ground. Anyway, I'm uh, Inga, I'm shutting down. Okay. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Olga. I will, I will just interject one line of my uh, of my own on the subject of heresy. Uh, just as a reminder to the learned uh, group here that uh, in First Corinthians eleven nineteen, Saint Paul says there should be heresies among you, so that the uh, uh, the, the the right uh, among you will be discovered. So uh, I I think we should talk and argue, and uh, I think that the uh, subject of what heresy really means and what consequences it has in the current church in the current world vis-a-vis -vis the uh, world we live in is is very important. I would very much like to get to uh, a very concrete question uh, by uh, Father John Gillians. Father John, if you don't mind, uh, I'll just read it read it out because uh, it's a brief question. Uh, he, uh, he asks, I would like to hear from the panelists what concrete steps they would want to see bishops take in response to the atrocities committed, supported by, uh, sorry, uh, that was Freudian, supported by Patriarch Kirill. Um, uh, please, is, uh, does anyone want to respond to that question? Yeah, sure, why not, Inga? <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, just very quickly to Zep Matushka, Mirson. Um, the 1872 council did not say heresy. 
It does not mention heresy, just putting it out there. And uh, there are sound Orthodox historians of blessed memory that would claim that ethnophilitism was condemned for ethnophilitist reasons. I think that it is a problem in our church, no question about that, but it's a problem that affects every Orthodox church. Um, again, um, heresy is fine. I accept, actually, that it could be a heresy. That is that, not more than that. It's a heresy. I hope that make, makes people feel better. What I'm saying is doesn't make me feel better. Certainly makes no difference to Kirill and really doesn't obviously make too much of a difference to the Orthodox churches. So I, again, what if for two years we were banging on, what's the assembly called? The Council of Europe or Jerry Pile of the World Council of Churches, but we... People of dialogue don't want to deal with these ecumenical leaders. Why don't we put our strength behind Jerry Pile and say, by the way, we've got a, one and a half thousand scholars here who think, like you, that Kirill's wrong to talk about holy war. Instead, we're stuck on just one notion, and that's all I'm saying. There may be more. And if there, and you should be open enough to at least as scholars and as theologians, and certainly as clerics, accept that there might be something more and not just one way or not. That surely for me is kind of the definition of heresy. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Um, may, may I say something, please? Yes, Francis, you had your head up, your hand up. Yes. Uh, thank you for the questions and the comments. Uh, I think that um, the issue of uh, uh, the issue raised by Olga is really important, is really crucial. And I think that the key to discuss this is to discuss about primacy, but discuss about primacy without prejudices and without distorted uh, ideas in mind. This is uh, something we cannot do now because this is an immense, a crucial point. Now, com coming back to um, the issue of heresy, I would like to say something. Uh, when, when Brandon Gallagher uh, developed his uh, thought, I was thinking that uh, if heresy has something to do with life, as it has been said, I mean, if heresy is not just an axiom, is not just a theoretical formula, is not just the kind of theoretical wording but if heresy, and this is something common to all uh, contemporary Orthodox dogmaticians, heresy actually begins first, and then, I mean, the distortion of life starts, and then the church was obliged to formulate the truth, to condemn heresy, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we, had the, we have the classical uh, heresies, I mean, Christological uh, Trinitarian, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But now we are not there, as Callistos were of uh, blessed memory reminded us. We are living in the century of anthropology, and so every uh, everything uh, that affects human life, uh, social life, our life, should be examined also under the angle of heresy. Don't be afraid of the word. Personally, I'm very reluctant to use this word. In my writings, I use it almost never, never use it, maybe once. But now we are in an exceptional context. Uh, what happens today has not a precedent in the Orthodox tradition. The blessing of the whole war, the blessing of the war, the blessing of the killing people, etc., etc. This kind of sacralization, this is something new. So that's why I use the examples of St. Basie, of uh, Patriarch Bartholomew, of uh, Metropolitan George Hodr, of uh, uh, Patriarch Paul, to, to show the difference of way, the different way of life. So if we speak, if we speak in terms of monophysitism, then I do agree with uh, 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 what's her name, uh, Morozova, to say that. Exactly, Mo monophysitism. Matusko, Olga Meyerson. 
Yeah, no, no. Also, uh, I think Morozova okay. wrote something in the in the in the messages. Uh, now we are there. I mean, if we refuse to discuss at least, then we 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 stay with the classical dogmatic heresies, and we refuse to see what is the impact of all this situation to our life. And the last word, I'm not the one who will condemn. Uh, I, I do agree with many of the approaches of Brandon, but there is a difference in my understanding. We need a council to decide what is heretical and what is not heretical. But until then, and to be realistic, I don't see for political reasons, given the political circumstances, I don't see in the near future any kind of council. Look what happened in the Patriarchate of Antioch, in the Patriarchate of Jerusalem, the Church of Bulgaria, the Church of Georgia. There is a kind, there is clearly a kind of political subjugation to the Russian power. So uh, try to be realistic. I don't see in the near future any kind of of, of council. So until the council uh, will decide who is heretical and who is not heretical, we can discuss, but we cannot decide. Now, regarding my friends and my circle, Father John in Greece, I'm surprised you use this argument because you know, you are aware that these people are supporting Putin, are supporting the Russian invasion. And if they disagree with me about um, the, 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 the use of heresy terminology, it is maybe just a, a kind of excuse. And last one. No, that's not what we're saying at all. Uh, no, sorry, can I, can, I, can I inter interrupt? This, yeah. this, uh, this, this, just, just one word and I will stop. Uh, this is not only the Council of Europe who used the term of terrorist organization for the Russian Orthodox Church. Recently, it has been discussion also in the Parliament of Estonia. Uh, and this is because this country really uh, feels the threat coming from the Russian side. So thank you for your patience with me. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Pantelis. Uh, Father Brandon, uh, would you like to uh, get to Father John's uh, question? Yeah. I'm not responding to Father John, but you know, uh, um, he did make some some comments, and and uh, I I think that in regard to uh, heresy. Uh, and what should the bishops do? I mean, we we are in a hierarchical church, but we have a bishop problem. The whole system, uh, as it were, is clogged up and is not working uh, properly. And, and in some ways, uh, this particular heresy, or whatever you want to call it, uh, um, I think it's we can agree maybe that it's not a myth. Um, anyways, this uh, particular uh, teaching or ideology or whatever on earth it is is, is uh, would have not been able to flourish um, uh, had it not been for the fact that we have a, a broken Episcopal system. Now, that being uh, the case, um, this isn't just a top-down uh, problem. This is, as, as one of my um, wonderful mentors, Father uh, Dennis P. Hatch of Blessed Memory, Ted has told me that, that you know, clericalism only exists if people um, raise up men and uh, basically tell them that they're going to live forever and uh, freeze them into their delusion. Um, and so um, what we must ask the bishops to do, and uh, um, we must do this as, as theologians and, and lay people, is, is ask them to actually do their role of rightly dividing the word of God's truth. Um, I can, uh, as a theologian, and in fact, I'm called to do this, church history has many instances of people who are not bishops, who would uh, advocate very strongly that something was an erroneous teaching. One thinks of Athanasius, obviously, but also local church leaders before there were councils. And so uh, what do we ask the, the bishops to do? We ask them that if we are going to be ruled by these uh, people who have been raised out of monasticism, as is sometimes said, and if they are going to, uh, as it were, rightly divide the word, the word of God's truth and defend the gospel and, uh, as it were, uh, proclaim uh, that gospel at their own ordination, that they actually try to rule on this matter and, and um, tell us, um, uh, now, will they do this? Um, I've been Orthodox now long enough to know that they won't. So 
um, it is left up to individual Christians, to the holy laity of God, um, which these bishops have forgotten that they belong to, to, um, as it were, speak boldly, and if I might say, with a little arrogance as well, because sometimes in order to allow the uh, gospel to be heard, you need to have boldness, as Father George Florovsky said. Uh, he describes St. Silouin as one with boldness. And so we ask them, and we keep asking them to, 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 to make a ruling, to gather together, and to defend our communion. Thank you very much for your uh, remarks, Brandon. Uh, I see that Father Cyril had his hand raised. Thank you. Uh, Inga, you already mentioned uh, the Poland uh, meaning of heresy. I think it is good to have heresies among us. Uh, in, in the Poland sense, uh, to have different opinions on the issue of heresy, to have heresies about the heresy. Uh, and I think it is really a hermeneutical uh, 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 topic. It's how we interpret this phenomenon of heresy. And I think it, there, should, there can, cannot be only one single interpretation of what it is, this Russian world. Uh, I think uh, to interpret uh, the Russian world phenomenon as a heresy is a legitimate interpretation, but not the only one. Uh, it's not uh, exhausting, it's not exclusive. Uh, and we need, when we use this term heresy, when we apply it, we need to, to, to keep in mind why we do so, which, uh, which audiences do we address. And I think the most uh, helpful uh, way of addressing, uh, of using, of utilizing this word would be to, uh, to address it to the Rus Russian audience in the first place. Because what happened in Russia, uh, Patrick Kirill managed to enchant the Russian people with this quasi-theological language, quasi-theological, quasi-religious messages to, uh, to enhance uh, the support to Putin among the Russian people. He used exactly the, the church terms, the church language, the language of religion. Therefore, to disenchant the Russian people from this enchantment, we need to still use a religious language, not a secular language, not a political language. It will not be for those people who got enchanted. We need to use religious, the language of our tradition, and heresy is a part of this language. So it's like it's like casting away the spell from the Russian soul, to use this, this word, uh, it's to disenchant the, the, these people, to make them, to make, to bring them back to the senses. That's, that's, I think, why this, this term can be helpful. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, we are, we're actually at the uh, end point. Uh, of the of the panel, I uh, do greatly regret it actually <laughs> because I would like to continue the co the conversation, uh, but I have to respect uh, everybody's time, uh, include the uh, first and foremost our um, uh, eminent panelists. So uh, a few things uh, uh, in uh, wrapping this up. Um, I really do not think that uh, uh, there, that we can offer any uh, concluding remarks to the conversation that is uh, unfolding as we speak, both uh, in the church and in the world. But hopefully uh, we can uh, at least uh, signal to uh, our sisters and brothers, as well as to our hierarchy that, uh, Whatever we, uh, whatever people want to uh, call this disaster, there is a disaster. And as I uh, started um, uh, saying when when I was opening the panel, uh, the cost of this is blood, lots of blood, and uh, fires that are continuing to uh, spread in the world, and uh, really the the scandal of what is numerically the largest Orthodox Church in the world proclaiming this a holy war and standing firmly behind a uh, um, essentially a neo-fascist regime. A regime is something that I think uh, even uh, our bishops who for whom the ostrich pose is just their normal mode of existence uh should not be allowed to ignore they should be called to um 
account. Um, anyway, we uh, we shall um, post the recording of the seminar on uh, the wheel the wheels YouTube site. I will follow up with an email with um, uh, to everyone who has uh, registered signed up for the seminar and everyone who's written uh, to us with some of the um, follow uh, up questions, maybe some of the comments from the chat that uh, have been made by the participants that are especially pertinent. Uh, and also now uh, remembering my duties as the um, editor of the wheel, um, I, um, I would like to ask everyone, uh, if you are not uh, connected to the wheel yet, uh, please, uh, uh, we are on all social media, but we have a very robust website and our um, online subscription starts at uh, the mere $35 uh, uh, a year with special rates for uh, students. Uh, we also have special rates for the members of the uh, Orthodox Theological Society in America. Um, and last but not least, uh, as I said earlier, we are uh, being independent gives us great freedom to do, say what we want, to invite who we want uh, without any oversight or um, uh, author uh, authority over us other than our own conscience and editorial consensus. But it also means that nobody uh, nobody supports us financially. So uh, if you are moved to do so, please um, uh, visit our website and uh, make a donation, you know, $10 of 250 people who registered for the seminar would be would translate into um, something nice for us. And thank you very much for your generosity. And again, um, profound thanks to uh, our wonderful panelists. Uh, it's, it is a very hot topic. It's very emotional for um, uh, all of us, uh, I really appreciate everyone making such a huge chunk on, of time on essentially a short notice. And uh, I think we need to continue talking, especially talking about what can be done. It's very nice to see friends and have discussions among friends. And yes, we are all very good about composing texts and gathering signatures, but um, as Quite a few people have already said, in some ways, uh, we're facing such a disaster that the time for greater action has come. And if we can't gather the ecumenical council uh, of the fireworks for all kinds of political reasons, there's got to be something else that uh, we can come up with as a body of Christ. Thank you very much. You well, are a blessed past. Thank you.